Good evening, members. Good evening, everyone. Um, good evening, members, and welcome to the Communities, Housing and Environment Committee meeting. Before we get to the agenda, may I take this opportunity to, to advise you that we are not expecting the fire alarm to sound tonight. So if it does, please remain seated, and Mrs. Matthews, to my right here, will assess the situation and give further instructions on the evacuation of the building, if appropriate. Tonight's proceedings will be webcast by the Council, but if anyone else is intending to record these proceedings, can they please let me know now? I ask this question not to stop you, but merely to ensure that members and other members of the public in the room know that this is taking place. There isn't anybody here, so that doesn't apply. Uh, uh, now to the agenda. Item one, apologies from absence. I have apologies from Councillor Mariam Ring. Before I go any further, as most of you know, uh, Mariam has been quite ill recently, has been in hospital and has had an operation. I heard from Councillor Perry today that she was hoping to come out of hospital today. Haven't heard anything since. But I hope you'll all join me in wishing Mariam a speedy recovery. Notification of substitute members. Substituting for Councillor Ring, Martin Round, and I can in fact tell you that Marion Ring has come home this afternoon. Good, that's, that's good news. I've also got um, a message from Councillor Perry that he is hoping to be here, but he may be late. That was before this happened. Um, item three, urgent items. Uh, there are no urgent items tonight. Notification of visiting members. There are no visiting members. Item five, disclosure by members and officers. Are there any? No, no? thank you. Item six, any disclosures of lobbying? No, okay. Item seven, to consider whether any item should be taken in private because of the possible disclosure of exempt information. We have no items uh, under that part of the agenda tonight. Item eight, minutes of the meeting held on the 20th of June. I'll go through them as usual, page by page. Page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. And page five. Are you happy for me to sign those minutes as a true record? Thank you. Item nine on the agenda, presentation of petitions. We have no petitions tonight. And answer, uh, item 10, questions and answer session for members of the public. We have no members of the public here tonight. Uh, I'm now going to change the agenda of this meeting around. As you probably all know, there is an emergency going on in Mason at the moment uh, of a gas leak, etc. And John is going to have to go back straight away. He's come from there. So I have agreed that I will bring item 14 forward um, in front of item 11. Is that okay with everyone? Okay. Uh, item 14 then, report of the Head of Housing and Community Services. John. No. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, Thank you, members, for uh, bringing forward the report. Um, the allocation scheme is the framework that sets out how the council gives priority between applicants who join our housing register, which in effect is the, what would traditionally be known as the housing list. It's um, framed against um, the statutory provisions in part six of the Housing Act. That's been amended over time, the Localism Act has amended it, and the government from time to time produces codes of guidance that we also have to have a reference to. Um, the latest change, major change that's coming is around the Homelessness Reduction Act, um, and that changes the point at which a person is entitled to seek assistance from the local authority when they're threatened with homelessness. And that's the major change that we're seeking your approval on tonight. Normally, minor amendments to the allocation scheme can be made by the approval of the director 
of regeneration place with the uh, consultation with the chair and vice chair of this committee. But as this represents something more than a, a minor amendment, it was felt appropriate to bring it to the meeting this evening. There are some other um, amendments that we're making at the same time, which again we thought was appropriate just to bring to you. So we've got a whole package of change that can be implemented at the same time. The easiest way probably to do this is to refer you to Appendix A, which starts on page 48. And what I'll do is I'll try and quickly walk you through the uh, changes that we're proposing, proposing and the rationale behind them. So the first one, which says section 9.3, the reason for changing the uh, period of residential qualifications for families, which I think at the moment is two years, is to bring it in line with the new code of guidance, which says five years. So where somebody is applying to go onto our list from outside of the area, they can rely on family close uh, family members that live in the borough currently uh, and that's been extended so those family members must have been resident in this area for a period of five years continuous period that, so that's the first amendment the second one is returning resident and uh, the reason why we needed to uh, clarify this is because at the moment it says two of the last five years but the way it's written that could mean that they spent like six month periods at a time within that five year period, which wasn't what was intended. So uh, the clarification is that it must be a continuous two year period within that five year allowance. So that's that one. The next amendment is, is the more significant one. So that's the one on page 49 marked paragraph 10.7.1. So currently what happens is that if somebody who is in private rented accommodation but doesn't have any housing need, they're adequately housed in private rented accommodation, but their landlord serves a section 21 notice, which is the two month notice uh, to leave the accommodation. Um, under the way the legislation is currently defined, they're not actually homeless at that stage or threatened with homelessness, it's at the point at which the possession order is granted, which is further down the line. It's a, it's a bit of a, something that was left over from the when the legislation was first amended back in 96 because it doesn't actually match the current position for a short short hold tenancies which have that two month notice it follows a traditional 28 day notice period that's all going to change when the homelessness reduction act comes in so that now acknowledges that there's this 56 day period where somebody is is under threat of homelessness so what we're proposing here is to get us ready for when that comes in which is likely to be in April uh, we're going to allow people to come onto the list at an earlier time in that process now than they currently can it actually helps the applicants who are in that situation and I know it causes um, some people a great deal of angst at the moment that they get served with the, that notice they feel like they've got to leave at the end of that notice. Their landlords pressure them to leave at that end of that notice, but we can't allow them onto their housing register at the current time. By making this change, it does mean that they come onto the list at an earlier stage. It gives them a greater opportunity to bid for property and resolve their uh, issue of homelessness. So that, that's the main change that we're proposing tonight. If I carry on through, and please, uh, I'll take questions at the end if you need any clarification around those. 10.8 um, is just, to acknowledge, it's just a, a tool to acknowledge that there will be situations that aren't covered in its entirety in the allocation scheme. We can't cover everything and we wouldn't want to because there may be exceptional circumstances around somebody's position that does warrant uh, um, their position to be looked at on the facts. So this amendment just means that uh, if there is one of those exceptional cases, it can be brought to my attention and I can use uh, my discretion in allowing them onto the register. Turning over the page then to page 50, uh, top of the page 11.5, we are reducing the uh, amount of capital. So at the moment, if somebody has up to £30,000 worth of savings, if you know, they have over that amount, they can't come onto the list because that's considered that they can resolve their own housing. It doesn't reflect the position in terms of uh, the benefits or cap, which is at £16,000. So we're just moving that figure down so that it's brought in line with uh, the position uh, concerning housing benefit entitlement. 
So the, what that means is that if somebody has up to £16,000 in worth of savings, they can come on, but if it's over that, then they will be expected to resolve their own housing within the private rented sector. Uh, similarly, with 11.6, um, the figure of £60,000 was set uh, in line with the, what was the government thinking about right to stay at the time. They were saying that people that earn up to £60,000, it was okay to be in social tenancy, but above that, they shouldn't really. So that's where the figure of £60,000 came from. Actually, looking at our own figures that we use around and the information we had about our strategic housing market assessment, we felt that was rather high, so it's been proposed to reduce that to £40,000. So again, you know, if somebody's earning more than £40,000, then ideally they ought to be able to resolve their housing in the private renter sector or through uh, one of the shared ownership schemes. And I don't, in honesty, think that we get very many of those uh, a year that, where we turn people down because of their earnings of, of that amount. Um, going below, the next one is just to clear up some uh, duplication in the current allocation scheme. And then 14.1, again, that was just to clarify for, for officers using the scheme because there was some duplication. Going over the page, then on page 51, 20.1, uh, We've had to make some clarification to the band in because at the moment there is one band that's uh, meant for medical, band B. The intention for band B was to be able to match people who needed a physical adaptation to the property to meet their medical needs. And that, that's normally around a physical need. So that would be where you needed a stair lift or a flush floor shower. But the way the current scheme was written, the unintentional consequence of that is that anybody that's allowed onto the scheme because, you know, they might have mental health problems, for example, uh, are being put into that band, which isn't the attention because you don't match somebody with those sort of difficulties up to a property that's been adapted for somebody with a physical disability. So we're not saying that people with that sort of condition can't come on. Indeed, they can still. It's just that they'll be placed into one of the other bands rather than band B. That way we just keep, keep that band succinct for the people that need it. It helps match people to properties better. Um, 22.4 just enables us to have discretion about when we do or we don't um, suspend somebody. So at the moment it says will, which means that we must do in all circumstances. But by changing that to may, I don't know, it's a minor change, but it does help us in terms of how we apply the allocation scheme. And, uh, sorry, turning over the page then, Page 52, top of the page, it just acknowledges that the, when the Home Choice Scheme, which is the Kemp Wide Choice Based Letting Scheme that we're a partnership to, is no longer going to use a television channel because people just don't use it, basically, so it's just not worth having. Um, it was popular at one time, I think, when they, we had all those different sorts of shop things on, on shopping channels, but it doesn't seem to be very popular anymore. 22.5. That's just a piece of clarification again, so not a, mine, uh, not a major change, that's just a minor change. And turning over to page 53, which is the last page, you'll be pleased to hear. 27.2, again, it was just a change in clarification around wording, because the, the intention is that um, if somebody's got more than eight weeks arrears, all our housing providers would refuse a, a nomination in, in that situation in any case. But what was happening at the moment, it was uh, it read either eight weeks of arrears or you, were, or you uh, uh, had a, a payment plan in place. But it didn't work the way it was written. So we needed to say it's eight weeks of arrears and you have to demonstrate that you're paying it off. Otherwise, if it was under eight weeks but nobody was paying for a year, they would still be entitled to come onto the list. But by doing this, it means you, it's got to be under the eight weeks and you've got to be paying it off, you know, even if it's a five or a week, as long as you can demonstrate you're making the regular payments, that's okay. 27.4. Um, um, again, this is just tidying up the current position. So if somebody's suspended for rent arrears or because they misbehaved in a former tenancy, um, at the moment, they can stay on the list and we can review it every six months for over and a day. Um, that, that does get into a silly position where somebody could be doing nothing about their position but remain on the list for three years later and still and nothing's done. So this just allows us that after a year, if somebody's not demonstrated a willingness to change that situation, we can remove them from the list. Uh, and the other, the other amendments are just minor ones to take notice of a restructure. So, Chairman, that... that in a nutshell, I hope I haven't cantered through that too quickly, but, um, but that, 
that are the changes we're seeking to make. Thank you. Thank you, John. Questions? Um, uh, Councillor Joy first. Well, John, um, I shouldn't say that. Uh, Mr Littlemore, you've given a few of my answers that I was questioning, so I thank you for that. One thing I did think when I was looking at this, and it's probably just me wanting to know, it's all very well reading about all these things, and it just made me think, well, I wonder how many actually get to that point where they're missing not paying the rent, where they're missing um, not doing their bids on time. I'd, I don't know whether anyone else does, but I would quite like to know how those figures, you know, how they are in Maidstone. Um, so that, that was one. The other one was 10.8. You said um, in exceptional circumstances you've got discretion. That was another thing that I questioned because I thought, how many times has that discretion had to be given? Is it something that happens quite often or it happens once a year? So it's, it's all very good and I appreciate all this, but it still doesn't give me what I wanted, if that makes sense. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, we can uh, what I'll do is, uh, similarly to the, uh, we sent some information around about activity on the Home Choice Scheme. I can go away and, and get the officers to run some reports to give you a feeling of how many times it happens where somebody's in the rear. Not, it's not a major issue, but it does become an issue where somebody keeps coming up the top of the shortlist and they haven't done anything about the arrears and we have to go through the shortlist and knock them out and it, it just means running back through. It, it takes time unnecessarily uh, for officers to do that. Um, so, but in terms of the total numbers, not majorly, but, but enough to you know, cause us to think we need to change the, the uh, allocation scheme to reflect that. Um, the, uh, the exceptional circumstances is issues, we currently have that around the local connection, and I've used that twice in the last 12 months. So, again, not, not and it has to be exceptional. Councillor Mortimer. Thank you. Um, John, under the Section 21 notices, there's an appeal procedure, which I think has to be carried out within six months. So how does that fit in with the 56 days? Does, do we, does that, you see where I'm getting there? I don't understand, because there's an appeal procedure. So if there's an appeal pending, can they go on the register then or not? I'm not quite sure what you mean by appeal. Do you mean appeal procedures to come onto the register or against being evicted? Right. What, what happens at the moment is somebody who's served with a Section 21 notice, there's a procedure through the courts by which the landlord to get what's called an accelerated possession order. There were some amendments brought into that to stop um, a retaliate, what were termed retaliatory uh, uh, eviction. So where a person had complained about repairs not being done, those sorts of things, and, and in response the landlord serves the notice. If the repairs have been reported to the local authority and there's you know, various stages that have to be gone through, then it does stay the process. I, I would put those slightly outside of what's imagined here because the vast majority of Section 21 notices go through an accelerated possession proceeding and that's a paper exercise basically. As long as the land will serve the correct notices and all the rest of it, the judge will, will has to sign it off. It's a mandatory ground for possession. There's no discretion on the, on the judge's part. Um, the Homelessness Reduction Act kind of takes us forward a whole stage. So the point at which somebody, if, if we can't prevent their homelessness in that 56 days, then the normal homeless procedure then kicks in. So that issue about whether the notices have been properly served, if we can't resolve it in that 56 days, which we would hope we would do, there would still be that, that period where we'd still be working with the applicant. So I don't think that issue is going to impact us. And to be honest with you, we haven't seen that issue. Right. Yeah, we've not seen many people actually use that new uh, legislation because it only affects people who became a tenant after a certain, certain date. And then there's a, as I say, there has to be a whole process that has gone through. So it might be early days before. Not everybody's aware of it as well, but... 
Yeah, I don't, I don't think this, what we're proposing today is, is going to negatively impact that in any way. I've got one more as well, and basically it's the wording, it's on page 68, but about the £16,000 worth of assets, and it does say uh, might give the opportunity to rent or buy. I don't I think we ought to have buy in there, because I don't think many people would be able to buy much for £16,000, whether it's a deposit at all. But that's on page, uh, page 68. Eleven dot five. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think that's in there uh, and to cover uh, shared ownership of the property. Well, well fair enough. Uh, yeah, okay, well, fair enough. All right. <laughs> Cheers. Councillor Roberts. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, there seems to be um, a, a small drafting error. On page 63, um, a paragraph seems to have been repeated. Um, because you've got uh, paragraph 9.6 and then you've got paragraph 9.6a and then where it starts in exceptional circumstances and ended, ending housing register, that paragraph is repeated at 9.7. You see what I mean? Yeah. yeah? Yeah, just a slip of the finger, you know, on the computer probably. Thank you. The, the, um, I think the allocation scheme that's attached at the back is the existing one, and you're quite right. There are some duplications in, in there, which is why we uh, yeah, will be amending that. Thank you for pointing that out. Any other questions, members? No? Okay. Uh, the recommendation for this agenda item is that the committee accept the proposed changes uh, to the housing allocation scheme. All in favour? No one against? Thanks, John. Thank you. By the way, did you all, members, did you all get your briefing note from John today? No. No. Well, it's on your, e it's on your emails. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah, it's going through, it's just in the menu back. Yeah. Good luck tonight, John. Yeah. Right, members, we'll go back to the... Um, Agenda in order. Item 11 is committee work programme. Any questions on the um, current committee work programme? Any observations on it at all? Oh, just to say, it's pretty full, isn't it? It is. Yes, Derek and I made sure of that. <laughs> No questions on it at all? Okay, thank you, members. Item 12, report of the Head of Environment and Public Realm, review of waste strategy, 2014-19. Jen. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, the report here in front of you is obviously a review of our current waste strategy that uh, was adopted in 2014. Um, the Council first introduced a waste strategy back in 2010, um, which was designed to take the service at the time that was at 32% uh, recycling rate, um, and it, it made some massive changes um, to the services that we operated then. So it introduced fortnightly refuse collections, weekly food waste collections, and saw our recycling rate rise to uh, 50%. Therefore, in 2014, a new waste strategy um, was brought in because we had achieved all the um, targets set out. Um, and that um, strategy looked at um, still staying along the lines of the uh, waste hierarchy and looking at reducing our waste, reusing it, and recycling where possible, and minimizing disposal. Um, the objectives set at that time were quite ambitious, um, including a 60% recycling rate by 2019. However, what the strategy didn't set out was any significant changes to the service. It was around behavioural change, encouraging, um, engaging with residents uh, to encourage them to recycle more using the services that already um, had been introduced. Um, 
last year, obviously, the strategy was reviewed and was brought to this committee, and uh, some members may remember that we um, reviewed the recycling target at that time because recycling rates nationally have been um, sort of plateauing, um, mainly due to um, there's been a, a drive to lightweight packaging and that type of thing. So actually, the recycling element is getting lighter. Unfortunately, the waste element tends to um, sort of stay the same. Um, so we saw the, the sort of elite, the, the authorities out there that were hitting 65% they were definitely dropping back to the, the upper 50s. Um, we managed to stay at 50% uh, uh, recycling. So we didn't see, I mean, you see a report that shows sort of some small fluctuations, but basically uh, we largely stayed at a 50% recycling rate. Um, when compared with actually across Kent, we were one of, I think, two authorities that actually saw us uh, maintain our figures rather than see that significant drop back. So this report obviously sets out, firstly, some of the activities that have taken place over the last um, 12 months. Uh, the biggest being, obviously, there was the, the big uh, Maidstone Food Waste Challenge incentive scheme, um, which has also, um, aside of that, there's been a big drive towards communications uh, around food waste and food waste service. Um, most notably, the um, stickers that went on the refuse bins to sort of advise residents not to put food waste in there. Actually, in um, the month after that was introduced, we saw a 28% increase in food waste, and we saw over 1,000 containers be ordered for the food waste service, which is really positive. A number of other um, sort of activities have, have taken place, including engagement events, the creation of a video, um, and some school education, so um, co competitions, workshops in schools to encourage uh, people to take part in the services. Um, as you'll see set out in the report, there are um, there were six objectives, seven objectives, sorry, um, for the, the waste strategy. Um, the vast majority of those have been positive, and we've seen an increase since last year. And um, our recycling rate, as I said, has uh, gone up where it dropped slightly back to 47% last year, is back at 50% this year. Uh, we've seen a decline in total waste uh, arisings. We've seen, again, a reduction in the cost of the service, um, and our um, public satisfaction has remained really high. Um, the only one that has seen a slight uh, sort of negative impact was actually the um, zero waste to landfill, which, when we set that target, was always going to be extremely ambitious because even um, if you send everything for energy from waste, the bottom ash that comes out the other end has to go somewhere and has to go to landfill. Um, and that's why you see a slight increase to 1.56%. Um, so overall, performance um, is good based on the fact that actually we're not, we, the, the service is costing us less, you know, in the, it costs us less in, than the previous years. And um, very little is done to change service. It's all around behavioural change. So the fact we've maintained the figure, you know, the, the uh, figures that we um, have is really positive. Um, however, at this point, we appreciate we're not going to hit the 55% recycling rate by 2019 without something significant sort of happening in that time. Um, as I explained at the beginning, the, the main impact on, on um, the performance has been service, service changes, which really drive performance forward. Um, so the proposal of this report is obviously um, to um, note the progress that we have made and the actions that have been undertaken, but to agree that actually the current strategy doesn't really reflect where we are right now. It sets some ambitious targets, but without actually looking at what is the ambition for the council, because actually our recycling rate is really good at the moment. Um, we're, at last report, we were sort of second in Kent, um, and there's a lot of authorities that are lingering sort of in the, the 40s, the, the low 40s. Um, so actually, we need to look at what do we want to achieve going forward. And so the proposal is to actually ha hold a workshop with members to understand what is the sort of what is our ambition um, to take the service forward. Do we want to look at uh, more radical service changes that drive performance and, and allow us to make 60% you know, recycling? Or are we happy with the performance we currently have? Um, so based on that, the proposal is to um, actually hold a workshop um, in September with members of, of the committee to actually shape a new strategy to look at having that adopted by April 2018. That would then take us for the final five years of the waste collection contract, which would, you know, depending on what comes out of that, it will either prepare us and have changes prior to the waste collection contract, or we'll decide actually we have a plan leading up to that and we can go out to tender uh, with some really sort of firm footings of what we want to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, before I throw it open to questions, can I um, 
Jem mentioned about item three, about the workshop. Um, I'm going to change the wording on item three regarding this workshop because I think it's very relevant. Uh, and what I'm proposing that the workshop is held in September or October, because we may not sure whether the town hall is going to be free, for all members and to be mandatory for the Communities, Housing and Environment Committee. And the rest of that um, carries on on item three. Is everyone happy with that uh, change of wording? Councillor Burton. If I may, Chairman, it was going to be something that would come out in my question to Mr Shepherd anyway. So if we could maybe put the brakes on the proposed change for the moment, have a discussion and come back. I understand the sentiment where it's coming from. I don't want to sound like I'm disagreeing with you for the sake of it, but I actually had a question regarding the workshop as the method for delivery and discussing this. Can I put the question now? Yes, you may. Yeah. Um, so, um, as Councillor Mortimer knows, because he's been involved in it, and I'm sure will agree with me, we've had um, a similar um, aim with the air quality action plan of bringing members into the drafting of that. And rather than a workshop as a delivery method for that, we've actually had a working group, and it's been a more ongoing collaborative process. And I wonder whether this is something that lends itself more to that style of working than us sitting in a room for an hour and then leaving it, if you see what I mean. Um, I think for... I completely see where you're coming from, and um, I think there is merit for members to be involved with the, you know, not just from that first sort of outset. I think opening it up to a wider audience initially to get that first feedback to really understand what we as a whole council um, view as our ambition for the waste collection service. We also wanted to look at, with that workshop, is bringing in, um, you know, experts or other people to um, sort of inform members' views on what's happening nationally, um, potentially with the Kent Resource Partnership. They have a lot of uh, sort of views across Kent of what's happening. So could I propose that we maybe start with this to allow all members, and then from that we could always ask for those who have a particular um, sort of interest to remain engaged with the process whilst we then look at drafting a strategy up until April. Councillor Joy. Yeah, I, I haven't got a problem with it at all. But when I read the papers, it just made me think, yeah, I agree, it should be open to other members and people. But who I'd quite like to have in the room are the people that do the things for us, like someone from Biffa, someone from... Because I think we sometimes miss a trick, that we, are, we sit here deciding, you know, we think this will be good, but it would be good to actually have the people that are doing it and even some of our staff that are doing the job. So I don't think it should just be members, and I think we should open it up a little bit to the people that actually probably know an awful lot more than I do, and I'll put my hand up for that. Um, yes, actually, um, because... BIFA um, have sort of contact with some of the high, really high performing authorities. That is something we'd sort of thought about actually to, to sort of tap into them as to who they might be able to sort of send where they have experience elsewhere. So definitely we'd look at doing that. And I like the idea of, you know, some of the staff as well because it impacts their day job. So. Well, I do think it's their choice. I don't think we can summon them to be here, no, like we should. Councillor Round. Thank you, Chair. And whilst I may only be subbing on this committee, I do take this committee particularly seriously, and especially waste strategies. As, as is probably known by those in the depot, I'm probably one of the few council members that have actually gone out on the bins. And uh, I can tell you it's, it's a pretty rewarding experience in some ways. But the one thing I continue to say to everybody, and I, I don't really get many complaints, is that this is probably the service that is probably the jewel in the crown of Maystone Borough Council. Very rarely do we get problems with it from a public point of view, and I think that's really important. But one of the things I have particularly mentioned, and I suppose you know, if there's a record against my household, then I am as guilty in my household of the contamination issue of not getting thin things in the bins right. It's not my fault personally, 
But in the last year, I have been employing care agencies. And what's particularly noticeable is those care agencies is they totally take no notice, totally, of what bin should be for what purpose. They've been putting food waste in the wrong bin. They've been putting solid plastics that are recyclable in the waste. And I mean, quite frankly, every time I've gone to the bin after the carers have been in, something is the wrong way. It is not appropriate. Now, if my household is doing that and is doing it every week, how many other people out there who are using carers are going through the same problem? I would have thought that actually it's quite a high percentage of contamination actually responsible from carers of people that are particularly elderly, those with various physical and mental needs. Um, I think it's an education area that does need to be looked at and one only needs to read the statistics to see how much home care, particularly those with disability and dementia issues, is on the increase and how care itself in the home is increasing. And if my home is anything to go by, and I've employed four different agencies in the last year, um, I would suggest it's quite a, a, a key issue. Uh, perhaps that should just be noted. Um, I think you're absolutely correct. Um, we've worked with a number of individual households where we've identified it's usually because they request a larger bin because they're struggling to contain their waste and it comes down to the fact that they have care agencies in and we've worked with some carers on an individual basis to try and resolve the issues. But I think yeah, part of our wider communications campaign and stuff needs to look at um, them as a, as a whole group and how we can actually sort of target that because actually trying to get into every individual household is quite a challenge. So, yeah, no, something that we'll definitely take forward. Councillor Webb. Uh, yes, uh, on very similar, well, firstly, very similar sort of uh, issues to that. I live in a communal sort of uh, area in flats and things, and there, when I moved in, I thought, oh, there's four dumpster-type bins um, in there. That must be for the recycling and things. And I ended up finding that all the rubbish was just going in one bin and not being segregated. So we really sort of do need to look, um, as it does say in here, to um, look at communal collections areas and sort those out, that they need to be told how to recycle and get prepared for that. Then there's also, um, talking about the uh, food waste challenge, there are also a lot of people who don't use the food waste bin because um, they have got home compost or things like that, that therefore, of course, they have the food caddy provided to them, but they don't actually need it because either they've got gardens or they've got allotment growers and things. So there is, it's, it's not like we can sort of say, oh, we'll provide you a food composter and things for your garden and things, but um, we've got to take into account that there's those reasons as well to not actually take up the scheme. And although it won't be a great amount, that's got to be some percentage of the people will not take up for that. Um, definitely. I mean, we've, we've tracked sort of the food waste uh, changes since it was introduced in 2011 because there was always the sort of ambition target to actually encourage people to actually generally waste less food in the first place. So you were hoping people would use home composting. We always encourage home composting. We have sort of... Um, uh, availability of compost, home compost bins through our website through a, a third party. Um, but we did track, obviously, that at first it had that success of food waste being diverted, you know, actually not being created. Um, but then you start seeing the, the waste sort of levels rising um, that they had done in the past couple of years to see actually people sort of, you know, they sort of stop and they, you know, give up um, uh, because potentially, I think I've sort of um, included in the report, is you become a victim of your own success. The more you get out of the refuse bin, suddenly there's an availability to put something back, and food waste is sometimes that easy option. Um, but I totally agree with you about the home composting bin um, and all that, and also agree with you about the flats, obviously. Um, Maidstone is, um, when we've explored with other authorities, particularly the high-performing, you know, we do have an exceptionally high percentage of communal collection points, you know, with 7,000 flats um, across the borough. And that is a challenge, and you'll see in the report we've just taken enforcement 
Um, I say enforcement action. We've taken the enforcement stance of issuing Section 46 notices and requiring them to follow that, which has been really successful, um, and we will continue that. And actually other authorities are wanting to find out what we're doing uh, because of that, because it's quite a new approach that not a lot have taken. So we'll be continuing that work. Councillor Robertson. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Following on from what uh, Councillor Round um, said about carers, um, before I retired, I was actually a support worker, and I used to visit quite a few clients in uh, Tunbridge and Morling, even though I lived in Maidstone. So, you know, you, you might not be familiar with the um, regime of another authority. Do you know what I mean? If you, if you like, live in Maidstone, do most of your work in Tunbridge and Morling, you've got to um, get up to speed on what Tunbridge and Morling do because it's all different, you know, and that just adds to the confusion. Any other questions, members? I'd just like to echo what Councillor Round said. The um, waste strategy is a bit of a crowning, um, crowning tool for um, Maidstone Borough Council, and I think we're lucky to have Jen to oversee it all. Uh, as there's no other questions, um, uh, the recommendations uh, for this item are as follows. Uh, number one, that the committee notes the progress made so far against the objectives set out in the Waste Strategy 2014-2019 Appendix A. Duly noted by everyone. Thank you. Uh, the second item is that um, agrees that the current Waste Strategy 2014-19 no longer delivers the Council's ambition for its waste and recycling services and that a new waste strategy for 2018-23 should be prepared and presented to the committee by April 2018. Where it's got should be prepared. So are you, what do you want we'll put in there? Then? Okay. Um, I'm not going to ask for a second or that, but is everyone happy with that? Okay, we'll change that then to will be prepared. Okay. Um, and has everybody agreed with that, with item two? Yep. Yeah. Uh, and the third one is where I've suggested the change. I'll read it out again just so that um, we know it. That a workshop is held in September or October for all members and to be mandatory for uh, Housing and Environment Committee. Um, sorry, for community. I'm reading the wrong line. Members of the, and to be mandatory for the members of the Community, Housing and Environment Committee to shape the new strategy and determine the level of ambition investment and appetite for bold service charges. Everyone agreed with that? Okay, thank you. Item 13, report the head of environment and public realm, waste collection, proposed new charges. Jen. Sorry, me again. Um, yes, yeah, so this report it's around the actual waste contract itself um, and um, the services that we actually currently provide. Um, so, as you're probably all aware, obviously BIFA um, provide our current waste collection contract um, alongside Ashford and Swaleborough Councils, um, and it is a 10-year contract. Um, as part of the contract, there is an annual review, and that takes into account two main um, sort of areas. Firstly, indexation, which looks at um, average weekly earnings, uh, CPI, and uh, DERV. Um, so look at the you know, diesel prices that obviously um, we're all aware are going up. Um, but it also looks at then property growth, increases in garden waste subscriptions, increases in use of services. Um, and then we calculate what the contract cost should be based on, on those. We pay a price per uh, property and then indexation is also applied. Um, it's worth firstly noting that obviously over the past three years, um, indexation um, in particular has been either low or, or, very, or negative. Um, so we had um, in the first year of the contract a uh, positive of 0.383% and then we've had two years of negative indexation whereby the contract core price has actually cost the council less than the previous year. Um, there is also there, but there has also then been property growth in that time. So obviously um, we've had to uh, pay for additional uh, sums for the additional properties that are bought online. 
this year, um, the indexation has been calculated and it's come out at a positive of 5.577%. Um, on top of that, with property growth, um, additional garden waste subscriptions, the overall increase um, for the budget compared with last year is £180,000. Um, as part of the budget setting process, there is an allowance made within that for growth within the contract because obviously it is to be expected that, con that costs would go up. Um, and that is a 3% um, that was set for the past year. Um, that means that there's actually overall a budget deficit of £95,000 that we need to look at identifying ways to uh, make savings or, um, as set out in this report, potentially increased charges to look at covering some of the, at least some of those costs. Um, so to go through, the, there are um, five recommendations within the report. Um, the first two are related to um, a single service. So I'll cover those sort of together. Um, the way, and as you'll see it all set out in this report, uh, the bulky waste collection charges are made um, is we currently have a, service, a system that residents can book a one to four item um, collection uh, for a cost of £24 or a five to eight item collection for £34. Uh, within that, they currently are, enabled, are entitled to have two white goods. Um, however, the charges that um, we have through the contract for actually paying for this service to BIFA is actually white goods are treated separately and treated as a single collection, um, which actually means that if a white good is um, added as one of the four items, one to four items, we'll actually pay BIFA for two collections, which means we're actually making a loss on that um, service. Um, so the proposal is we've looked at, and you'll see some of the other charges set out by other authorities, we've looked at um, fam authorities that are classed as our family group, and we've looked at neighboring authorities to see what they charge. Um, and the proposal is to um, introduce a new charge, particularly for white goods of 20 pounds. White goods have to be treated separately to other waste, so they are classed as hazardous, so they do require additional, um, you know, separate collections anyway and additional uh, sort of disposal rec uh, requirements. Um, so that £20 charge will cover um, those costs that we currently incur from our contract. Um, the second part of the bulky um, charges that's proposed, obviously, is that um, last year, a subsidised bulky collection charge was introduced uh, for those in receipt of council tax reduction benefit. Um, it is proposed that actually that is limited to either one white good or a one to four item collection uh, because we currently limit them to just one, more to, one to four item collection. Uh, just for note, in the past 12 months, we've only had 91 bookings that are subsidised, just sort of to set that into context. Um, Moving on then to the next service would be, um, is regarding the black sack um, collection. Um, so we have a small number of properties, I think it's about two and a half, if I remember, yeah, just short of two and a half thousand properties in the borough that can't accommodate um, wheeled bins. Predominantly they either have no storage space or they have no rear access and nowhere, therefore they can um, actually present, their bin, present a bin for collection. Uh, these properties are currently provided with an annual supply of black sacks um, that um, they receive 104 black sacks, it's two deliveries over the course of a year, um, which costs the council um, just short of £12,500. Um, the view is that actually most people with wheel bins will purchase their own sacks to present their waste in and then dispose of in the, sack, in the bin. Um, so actually, is there a requirement to provide black sacks free of charge, which most other residents are purchasing anyway to dispose of their waste? So the, the recommendation is that actually um, we don't do that. We don't have a requirement to only collect branded bags. And actually, you know, the feedback can be that if people move into these properties, because obviously they're, they're usually flats above a shop or somewhere without outside space, there might not be black sacks there anyway, so they're purchasing their own um, when, when they move in. Um, the next um, proposal is regarding the clinical waste. This actually doesn't set out um, savings um, as the uh, previous two uh, proposals do. Um, this is regarding the fact that there is an increasing demand for the clinical waste uh, service. Um, so there are currently just over 3,000 residents resident, uh, registered for a clinical waste service. The vast majority of those are for um, sharps collections. We have 15 properties that actually require a weekly clinical collection in bags. Um, so the, 
with the, and we have th around 30 requests a month coming in, so that sort of register is growing and growing. So there is the potential that people are going to be waiting longer and longer to, you know, to try and book a collection anyway. So the proposal is that actually we limit to two collections a year, which the vast majority, I mean, if you, you work out how many collections we actually can make in a year and you see that we've got that many residents on the list, actually the vast majority are having one or two collections a year because they're saving up their sharps boxes. Most of these are due to um, uh, the, the diabetic um, sort of pens, which have very small sharps and therefore they can get a lot into a sharps box. Um, so the, the suggestion is to limit it to two a year. If people really wanted more collections, then there would be a small charge levied that would cover our costs, which would be five pounds. But there is no proposal to use that as a generation of, of income towards these suggestions. Um, the final um, proposal um, is regarding the garden waste collection service, which is a very successful service and generates um, a significant income to cover um, the, not only sort of to cover its costs, but generate to, to provide income to support the waste services we provide. Um, however, over um, sort of many years, we have um, regular requests for, um, could it be weekly in, in, in the summer months when there's particular demand? Obviously, demand usually starts about March and can carry all the way through to sort of the clear up time, October, September, October time. So the proposal here is that actually we, we start a register of interest for a seasonal weekly garden waste collection to supplement the existing fortnightly service. So it's not the option that people can just have a weekly during the summer and nothing during the winter. It would be for those residents, and bear in mind we have, um, I think it's the figure in here is 23,500. It's literally, you know, it goes um, up almost daily. There are 23,500 subscribers to the fortnightly service um, to offer those residents the opportunity to increase their collections during the six months that are the peak growing season um, and for there to be um, a charge. So rather than pay the £37 they'd currently pay for their fortnightly, they'd pay a total of £55 to cover fortnightly all year, but the weekly during the summer months. Um, and, but we need to obviously, the proposal is to have that register of interest to ensure that we have the enough demand to meet the costs that we would have to incur to lay on that additional vehicle during those months. Um, and that, um, within this report, is proposing that it would um, potentially generate, on a conservative estimate, around £30,000 a year. Bear in mind, um, the actual, um, the fortnightly garden waste, waste service does significantly more than that. We're talking nearly 700,000 income. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Um, I have Councillor Joy at the moment. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I know I'm sitting here tonight as a councillor, but I want to speak more as a resident because when I read the papers and thought if I was to knock on a few doors and just say, how do you feel about this? Because it, it worried me when I read the 20 pounds. Let's go for the first one. The new charge of 20 pounds for the collection of white goods. I totally understand that we are here and we've got to be able to cover the costs. I think my heart is telling me 20 pounds when you've got a, uh, a fridge that's just broken down, right? And you, there's nothing you can do. You've got to replace it. So you've got that income of going out and spending a new fridge. And then you're then saying £20 to come and take it away. I, I can't put my hand up and say that I can say that that's okay. I think £20 for one item, even though I know the cost involved, is a lot to ask. Then I read down to the next um, recommendation that says about the subsidy for tax really for those on benefits and don't get me wrong I am totally in favour of helping any resident in Maidstone that needs help and has to rely on that help but I want to speak for the ones that are not on that benefit and they try hard they could be low income but they struggle and I just want to try and understand for myself that are we 100% sure that that £20 charge is the only way that we can build up our um, income um, in a more fairer way. Because when I looked at it, I thought, £10, yeah, I can understand. Come and get my fridge for £10. And I know if I've got one of these plush American ones, which I haven't, it would be more. 
but it was, it was reading the report, and maybe I'm a little bit naive, but I had no idea things like, and you can all say you knew, when you move into a property, I didn't know that you had to pay £50 for a, your bins when you move into a property. I didn't know that. So who, who pays that? Is it the developer if it's a new home? There's lots of questions like that, that this income is coming in, but I don't quite understand where it's coming from and what it covers. So can we start with that? So I pick up the issue of the bins and the charging for the, for the bins. Um, that generally it comes from a new developer because the vast majority are for new builds. Um, however, there is a requirement that if a person moves into a property, so it's, it's, it's not just new builds, it is also somebody moving into a property if there are not bins already there. And that therefore is a requirement when as part of the searches and as part of um, having moved recently myself, we know that actually it's, it is even a tick box now on the fixtures and fittings list are there bins provided? And it's the requirement of someone moving in to make sure that the previous owner leaves those bins behind or is going to pay for them. But the vast majority, in fairness, is actually it's new builds that um, will generate that. And it is actually just covering the cost of the bin. There is not um, any sort of huge amount of um, sort of profit. You know, a bin is £20. Um, so it's, you know, it is cost price. So can I come back? That, that's really helpful. But I just think there's not enough people that I didn't know it. And I just thought if I was moving house, the last thing I'd be thinking, well, I haven't moved for a long time, was to check whether I've got my two bins there waiting for me and that I'd have to pay £50 for it. So that's good in the report because that can be shared. As I say, going back to the recommendations, I think there's three that I'm quite happy with, two that I'd like to listen to a bit more debate from the other members before I make any decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thank you. Um, one quick question. The clinical waste, is it one of our statutory duties? As a, do we have to do it? Um, we have to do it, however, we can make a charge for it. So we could make a charge. Not, I can't find any real evidence of any authorities that have gone down the route of charging outright for it, because obviously... Yeah, but, but no, it, it, it's something we need to provide, but we can make a charge for. You know, similarly, I know garden waste isn't statutory, but, you know, you can, there are certain items you can make a charge for. Um, my next point is, uh, Councillor Joy mentioned the £10 charge. Do you think there's any mileage if we experimented with £10? Because I see lots of fridges, white goods in front gardens, on the sides of the road and that. And we've got this fly tipping issue. Um, could we experiment and have a report in, say, 12 months' time and then revisit, perhaps? Um, obviously, the main issue with the £10 charge is we will be charged um, £15.50 based on indexation that may go up slightly from the contractor. So we'd instantly, every fridge that we would collect, we would be subsidising it by £5.50. Um, having done, uh, basically used last year's figures and, done, and carried out some modelling on that, on a £10 charge, the issue that we have is people who um, book a one to four items currently and one of those items is a fridge, we do not know if they would still, if, if they're putting the other items in just because they had that opportunity. So on a worst case scenario, we would be £6,000 worse off with a £10 charge than we currently are. On a best case scenario, it would bring in £5,000 income as opposed to, I think it's the 15000 we set out in the report. Um, one point I was going to add is obviously we was not listed in the report directly, but we know uh, retailers um, put a charge of about £25 on if you buy a new fridge and want a fridge removed from them. So their charge is £25. So this is below a retailer's charge. Okay. Councillor Byrne. Sorry, that all got a bit confusing there, Chairman. Thank you. Um, it, the words have actually just been taken out of my mouth. I've, I've, I totally understand where you're coming from, um, Councillor Joy, but I, I've just moved flat. I moved into a flat that had a freezer in it. I thought, brilliant, haven't got to buy a freezer. Turned it on, didn't work. So the council came to collect it 
but what I was looking at when I bought my new fridge was to see the comparative charge of what somebody in the private sector would charge me to take away. So whilst I understand what you're saying, £20, you know, it, it, particularly when you're stuck in the situation where your freeze has just gone or whatever it may be, does seem like a lot of money. But when you're looking at a £95,000 budget deficit here is where we've got to try and find a way of recovering some costs. And actually, when you compare it to the rest of the market, it's, it's quite reasonable. That is just the reality of what it costs to have it removed. Councillor Robertson. Um, yes, Chairman. I've just got a query. I mean, we're, we're referring to white goods, um, but um, are we only talking about um, fridges that actually need a, a specialist person to, you know, deal with the CFCs, or... Um, are washing machines included in white goods? Because I'm not aware that they need any special treatment for, uh, for disposal. Can, can uh, Mrs. Shepherd just clarify that, please? Um, we are talking fridges, freezers, fridge freezers. So all of those um, things, yes. We're not talking any other kitchen appliances. It's the particular um, hazardous items um, that require those um, separate collection and disposal. So does that mean a washing machine would be a bulky item? Yes. Any other questions, councillors? <coughs> Councillor Moore. Thank you. Um, regarding the £66,000 £66, that we can't compensate for at the moment, do you, could you possibly tell us any other ideas you may have I'm sure you've thought about it, Jen. Um, actually, that's, it is really difficult, hence this report um, obviously sets out the, um, the most obvious options. And, and with the contract, um, you'll all be aware that you know, we made significant savings from it, so you can only push it so far. Um, however, I think once the work is started with the garden waste, there is huge potential for that to cover a, more of, of, of the um, deficit than we're at first anticipating. Um, there are other areas we are looking at um, within the wider depot team to see if we can um, find other ways to make additional savings. However, we have to be wary that we've already um, made a number of commitments through the medium-term financial strategy and we don't want to obviously be duplicating. Um, so I hope to potentially be back here in um, another couple of months with maybe some more, um, more ideas or particularly some more feedback from that garden waste service because that is our biggest opportunity to really cover um, that deficit and to make some profit. Councillor Joy. Again. Looking at the recommendation again then, I think it is where it says white goods that is where I'm confused and not happy with. If it said fridge or freezer, fridge or freezer, so that people know it's because of yes. what's in your fridge freezer. Mm. But if someone was to say to someone white goods mm. and when you're buying a kitchen, mm. to me that would include your washing machine. Something so it is a little bit yeah. unclear in my... Yeah. yeah, so if we're going to go with it, I think it should say why and yes. what it is we're actually charging for. Yes. Because if I don't understand it, I can't be the only one that doesn't understand Jen. Um, I think we, we could insert the word hazardous, so it makes it very clear. Um, and, you know, we will, when we come to putting, obviously there's an online booking form and all of that for bulkies, and whether people are contacting through the, you know, um, contact centre or if they're looking online, we'll make it very clear that hazardous white goods basically mean fridges, freezers, fridge freezers. <laughs> Councillor Webster. Thank you. <laughs> um, my question is obviously on the two free collections per year on the clinical waste, um, the shark boxes is obviously my issue. My brother's um, insulin dependent, um, diabetic, and I'm thinking of the two free collections a year, that's you know, not particularly great if you're insulin dependent and you could be injecting up to three times a day. Um, 
Do we actually supply the boxes ourselves at from Maidstone Borough Council is my first question. No, we don't. Um, they're available through doctors on prescription, so we don't provide the boxes. However, they do varying sizes of boxes, and we're more than happy to collect two, three, four, five, six, however many boxes people can have on those occasions. It's just reducing the number of visits, just purely because the demand for the service to try and prevent people having to sort of, you know, um, basically join a queue of people who then can't book the service. So at these, this present time, we don't charge for this service at the minute? No, we don't charge for clinical collections. Um, so can they actually take the boxes to the pharmacy? Instead of having, because I've got children myself, and to be honest with you, if I was insulin dependent, with saying diabetic or something, I wouldn't like three or four boxes piled up, ready for you guys to come twice a year. And if funds are tight, you know, people run benefits and stuff like that, paying five pounds every month could be quite hard for them. Um, as we said, the reality is most people only book sort of once or twice a year anyway and do save them up because actually they don't necessarily want to have them sat outside their house every week or every you know fortnight having a collection um we try and come back to your previous your first point sorry can they take him to like a pharmacy um, generally pharmacies won't take them back just because of a storage issues and obviously then they're collecting a waste type if it's your own waste it's fine but if you're actually collecting waste from other people it becomes sort of more hazardous and has to be dealt with differently okay councillor rand thank you chair I, um i'm going to ask the officer a couple of questions which i actually don't expect you to have the answers now you might have some sort of guesswork, but um, I'd be grateful. And when one looks at the comparison chart between other authorities, <clears throat> it's highly noticeable that Tunbridge Wells charge £148.80 for a standard charge, whatever it may be, whether it's white goods or not. It's also particularly noticeable that Canterbury charge £60.40. I'm wondering whether you have any inkling, and as I said, I don't expect you to have the answer to that question at this stage. I'm wondering whether you have an inkling as to whether they're any more successful at it than we are, and whether they have any more fly-tipping than we do because of those problems. And is it more profitable for them than it is for us? Um, you're right, I don't have those answers um, straight ahead. All I can say is to clarify the Tunbridge Wells, it's because it is a £37 charge or something per item. So they literally charge per every single item. Hence, where I've said standard charge, it's just as a comparison to see actually what are four items actually equivalent to. Um, I think it's more than that. But um, I know the only person I, uh, I have spoken to um, is Tunbridge and Morling, who are actually not on this list as, as a comparator, but uh, just because I happened to have a chance conversation with them after this report was produced, which said they do have a separate charge for fridges and they've not seen any um, increase in, in fly tipping or anything along those lines, um, because generally these people would have paid for us, they'd have paid £24, and if they've just got a fridge, actually some people are going to be better off. And so people who've just got a fridge aren't going to pay £24 anymore, they're going to pay £20, um, and therefore that will hopefully encourage them if they've just got a fridge to get rid of it. Um, but certainly we can um, look at how successful their um, services are at generating any sort of income for the authorities uh, based on those figures um, again some of them just put them up each year by sort of an indexation rate hence they have random ra sort of amounts of like 40p um, but we can certainly explore that Councillor Joy just like to say that you mentioned fly tipping I think in some of those boroughs though they still have freighter service don't they Tumbridge and Morling do um, obviously most freighter services don't take white goods or hazardous white goods because they can't go in the back and, and they certainly our service didn't take um, hazardous white goods because they can't be compacted
sorry. Number three, the provision of the black sacks to properties not suitable for wheeled bins, which I think we should. Um, I'm a bit mixed on this one, um, and it's easy for me to say I'm all right because I've got a bin, so I don't need to buy sacks. But I don't feel quite so precious because if I needed to buy sacks, I would go to the um, pound shop. So I personally haven't got a big thing about um, charges being dropped for the black sacks and they supply their own. But again, I'm hoping to hear what others think on that one. Councillor Bird. I quite agree. I don't see a problem with the proposed change. I think that the, the principle that those who do have can accommodate wheelie bins or whatever type of bin they might be will still go out and buy their own black sacks. It's you know, it's, it's an unfortunate circumstance if somebody hasn't got the room to be able to allocate to wheelie bins, but there's no need for us to be providing an additional service that can easily be facilitated by Poundland, for example. Yeah, I, I would imagine it probably costs us substantially more to buy them in even in bulk and then post them out to everybody. So, um, yeah, no problems with it from... Mortimer. Just a quick one, Jen. Last, I think it was last year I went to a meeting and we were talking about running a campaign knowing where your waste goes mm -hmm. this year. Are we going to do it? So the others that collect bulky items from your hand, you shouldn't ask them for their license? Um, definitely. As part of our um, litter strategy that we're working on as well, we're capturing um, sort of the fly tipping element and making sure um, residents certainly have that duty, know about their duty of care, that they need to know where their waste is going, particularly because, um, you know, there is um, growing trends of, of operators on Facebook that will take all your waste away for, you know, um, 20 pounds. And it's quite obvious that, you know, at 140 pounds a tonne to dispose of, of waste, you know, you, there's something not quite right with the, with the sum. So there will be a big push on duty of care and making sure people understand the importance of knowing where their waste is going and what type of sort of evidence they need because sometimes it can be quite daunting to think, oh my goodness, I need a full duty of care waste transfer note from um, the person that's taking it. But actually, it's not necessarily that cumbersome. You just need to have certain details, the fact they've got waste carrier's license, what the number is and all of that. So just putting a few pointers to residents. That's definitely on the, the plans for this year. Any other questions, members? Councillor Robertson. I've got one more before we go to the recommendation. Sorry. Um, and I've just forgotten what it was. Sorry. Councillor Robertson. Uh, yes, uh, Chairman. Um, just uh, uh, information, really. Um, I'm having a turnout at home. And um, if you actually go on KCC's website, um, they will actually tell you um, all, all the things that you can take to Tovel and um, how, how you should um, take it. And um, they, they even take hazardous waste as well. It's a very useful um, part of their website, actually. So, you know, thanks. Thank you. Have you got it now? Yeah, item Council two on right. the recommendation. Sorry. It's saying, that's the other one we haven't really discussed, that the subsidised bulky change is changed to offer those in receipt of council tax reduction either one white good or one to four. I just want to make sure that everybody is clear on what we're, we're offering there. And is that a save, you know, what saving would that be? Is, are they getting more than what they had before? Um, no, at the moment they can have one, one to four item. But obviously the fact that we're separating fridges out, it's sort of saying actually that one to, one to four item could be a fridge instead. So it's um, offering them to have either. Right, okay, I've got that. Um, sorry, you off? That's it. So are we saying then that it's no change to the cost, but if we find out that there is fly tipping of, I'm not going to use the word white goods, of fridges, will that be recorded so that can come back so that we can relook at it? I just wanted that to be put in the, before we all agree that we're going to do it, because it could have 
a knock-on effect with fly tipping if people couldn't afford that £20? Um, yes, I'm more than happy to say that actually, you know, we can monitor it for, uh, fridges are recorded separately anyway because part yeah. of the requirements, so we can separate it out what are fridges when, uh, from the fly tips. Um, and if you want to say a specified amount of time that we come back with that data so you can reconsider it, I'm more than happy to do that. Okay. Councillor Byrne. Quite happy to agree that we have that information come to us, but I think we've got to be very careful not to send out a slightly backwards message that this is a charge we're applying now. Um, if it means that you actually then illegally fly to fix, you don't want to pay the 20 quid, we're monitoring it and might change our minds. We don't want to accidentally be sending that message out. Do you see what I mean? It's... I think it was more for our infra information rather than residents. It's just so that we have got a, you know, a feel of what's happening with the fly tipping. Any other questions? No? Um, right, I've got, um, had an email from Councillor Springer. This is just regarding um, number five on this report. Um, she's asked me to convey her support about the extra garden bin collections as she cannot be here herself to do it. And she said she wants a name put on the list already and that she's happy to pay extra charge for weekly garden bin collection in the, in the summer months. Yeah, well, I, I do that as well. So. <laughs> okay, members, um, I'm going to take these one at a time now. The first one recommendation is that a new charge of £20 for the collection of white goods as part of the bulky waste collection service is introduced. Hazardous. Sorry? Hazardous goods. Hazardous goods. Mm. Hazardous waste. Hazardous waste. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Can we not have fridges and freezers? Hazardous goods, yeah. fridges and freezers, yeah. please, yeah. rather than white goods. Mm. Yeah? Well, they've got, yeah, they've got glass in them anyway, haven't they? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, all in favour of that one? Anyone against? No? That's unanimous. Recommendation two, that the subsidised bulky charge is changed to offer those in receipt of council tax reduction benefit either one white good or one to four item collection per year. Is that right? That's not changed. Would that be hazardous? Would that be hazardous again? That's with hazardous put in there. Yep. All in favour? Anyone against? So, well, all in favour? Against? Abstentions? That's carried. Recommendation three, that the annual provision of black sacks to properties not suitable for wheeled bins is withdrawn. All in favour? And that, that's carried. You can vote, by the way, John. <laughs> right, thank you. Uh, recommendation four, that a limit of two free collections per year is introduced for the collection of clinical waste sharps boxes and the charge of five pounds is made for additional requests. All in favour? Against? Abstentions. Oh, is that against or abstention, John? And finally, recommendation five, that a register of interest for a seasonal weekly garden waste service as a supplement to the existing fortnightly collections is carried out to determine its viability. Are we all agreed on that one? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jen. Um, that concludes tonight's meeting. Before we go, can I remind you all about the um, depot open day tomorrow, um, which is at two o'clock, where Jen has laid on a big feast for us before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you haven't? Oh, okay. <laughs> which, yes, which she collected out of the waste bins. <laughs> um, so, yes, if, if, you can, uh, um, if you can attend that tomorrow, that should be interesting. Okay. Thank you very much, members. I declare the meeting closed. <laughs>